Now, a very warm sense of academic history and distinction comes with the invitation to introduce Catherine, who completed her PhD in communication at the University of Massachusetts in 2001. I had the good fortune to supervise her, although I know I look 12. <laughs> um, though I assure you, she had from the get-go, I mean, or I was 12 at the time now, you know, uh, she had from the get-go an independent intellect and quickly became her own professional scholar um, who uh, I'm slow to claim, not because I'm not very admiring, but because I know uh, that Catherine has her own um, intellectual engines running and always has. She is now a professor of film and media studies at the University of Auckland, which is a venturesome post for her to have taken up and one she took up after years as associate professor and associate dean for graduate studies at the Edinburgh School uh, for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. I'll say a little bit about her work um, in the sequence leading up to the topic she's going to talk, Catherine's going to talk about today. Catherine started her distinguished publication record early with work from her master's thesis on the gay and non-gay reception of what was then called gay window advertising, ads that gays, queers would recognize, but wouldn't necessarily be recognized as that by people not thus identified. So a lot of what would appear to others as uh, buddy images were homoerotic images to people who wanted to see them that way, and of course lots of us did. From there, uh, Catherine undertook the major study, the standard there really, of the formation of the gay market in the United States, the subject of her dissertation and of her first book, Business, Not Politics, The Making of the Gay Market from Columbia. Not long after Business, Not Politics came out, so did Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, about which Catherine published a terrific essay, which again became a standard bearer on commentary on Queer Eye and both its feared and celebrated reception as a marker of things to come in queer media. From Queer Eye and related projects in makeover television, Catherine developed her most recent book, published by NYD Press last year, called The Makeover, Reality Television and Reflexive Audiences. As Catherine tours with The Makeover, she's also wrapping up her current project, or the research phase of her current project, an international study of sex museums. Her talk today, what is a sex museum knowledge in uh, no, no, I've got the ten wrong bodies. Ooh. Bodies of knowledge. Miss the bodies mistake. <laughs> bodies of knowledge in marginal institutions. Uh, comes from that study and draws. Um, I'm expecting, I haven't heard Catherine talk about this work, so I especially look forward to it. But I'm expecting that it draws from her long commitment to scholarship and cultural production as parallel practices. Uh, something she understands well from her work as filmmaker as well as teacher scholar including three productions for the Media Education Foundation in Northampton and work on the fourth on makeover television soon to be completed. So Catherine is quite simply a leading scholar in queer and media studies and also brings her influence to the field as co-editor of the great journal of critical studies and media communication, media, media communication, speaking as her former teacher, but especially as her colleague who brings me pride and pleasure to welcome her this afternoon. Welcome. Thank you very much, Lisa. That was um, a, a joy and a privilege um, to, to have you, you introduce me today. Um, and, um, and I also want um, to thank um, Karen and, uh, and also. Uh, Nairi Rubinian from the Fire College Women's Studies Research Centre, who've been hosting um, us this fall. It's just, it's just been a t terrific experience. Um, and also to thank and acknowledge the other fellows um, with whom a sort of ongoing, stimulating conversation about um, our work has really been um, formative for me. Um, and, and also Jennifer and Hampshire for hosting um, us this afternoon. So, um, for those of you um, who, who may know my other work, um, which, as Lisa mentioned, was um, has really focused on gay television and uh, reality. Te I'm sorry, gay media and reality television. 
this talk might seem like something of a departure. And so here I'm going to be looking at institutions that publicly display erotic materials and what and how these spaces and obje objects communicate about sex. Uh, this is a transnational study um, looking at museums across East Asia, Europe, and the United States. And it's also work in progress. That's sort of a little bit of a warning here um, in terms of integration, of conceptual integration of this space. But um, what's exciting about it is that it's profoundly interdisciplinary. Uh, interdisciplinary. Um, so it brings together communication and media studies, which is my training, but also museum studies, art history, gender and queer studies, um, and post-colonial critiques, amongst others. So um, I return once again here to questions about the role of sexuality in commercial culture and it's been a thread through, through my work. Um, and particularly what commodified sex and can communicate about broader and increasingly transnational cultural processes. Okay, so um, in the furthest room at the Museo de la, de la Rotica in Barcelona, Spain, um, there's a plaster cast <coughs> of um, a, a sculpture um, called uh, Doriforus that some of you may be familiar with. Um, and this is one of the most um, uh, famous examples of Greek sculpture, which would have originally been cast in bronze, and there's a marble statue um, in the museum in Naples, a copy of this. So this plaster copy in the Barcelona Sex Museum is painted a color that we can sort of vaguely call bronze, um, i.e. shiny brown paint. Um, and also, but also what was immediately striking to me when I first saw it was that it has this white penis. Um, and so I'm, I'm gonna start with this statue because it offers a, a point of departure to consider some of the ways that sex museums diverge from the norms of what we usually think of as museums. And this is in two ways. Um, firstly, that sex museums uh, don't usually maintain the ban on touching exhibits. So when mm -hmm. I interviewed a staff member about this piece um, after we'd seen it and why the penis was white, she said, because everybody touches it. <laughs> um, and secondly, sex museums don't really care about <coughs> origins or authenticity in the same way that other museums do. So sex museums don't fetishize the original. Uh, reproductions are quite common, and you can see in the background here there are also reproductions of uh, pottery plates from Pompeii. So what's striking about this is that this tolerance um, towards both touching and copy seems at odds with the conventions of contemporary Western museums. So this begs the question, what kind of museums are sex museums? And I'm using the term sex museums here pretty broadly to encompass a range of institutions that display erotic materials to the public. Most but not all are privately owned and profit oriented. Um, and many, if not, yeah, many, if not, not all, but most are, are located in tourist neighborhoods um, or regions or tourist regions of a country. So when I began thinking about this project um, and trying to make sense of, of the initial data, I went to Tony Bennett's classic cultural studies work on the birth of the museum. And here he's talking about the development of contemporary national civic museums um, and how this, these came about since most actively in the mid-19th century and how that they, they were kind of consolidated from, all, uh, from earlier forms of public space and modes of display. And Bennett argues that these museums reorganize bodies of knowledge according to consolidating academic fields and things like anthropology. Um, and also that they assumed chronologies of progress in their design. Um, and another quality of these museums was that they drew from private collections often, um, but they were the first museums that were generally open to a wide public, um, even as they instilled fairly narrow norms about appropriate forms of behavior and engagement with the exhibits. And, and the early museums were expressly pedagogic about what to wear, how to behave, and so on. Um, so the prehistory to, this mo to these modern museums um, we can see in other kinds of exhibition, private art collections, waxworks, carnival sideshows, medical collections, and so on. And some of these have actually continued as a kind of shadow economy of the more legitimate types of exhibition. And we can think about something like Madame Tussauds waxworks um, shows um, in, in originating in London, but also um, I noticed a couple of weeks ago there's a branch of, of that um, exhibition in Shanghai. Um, but also, um, 
there's, we can also think about Bennett's argument um, as actually poss possibly only representing a moment in changing practices of exhibition. Um, and as he was writing his book in 1995, we could already see that contemporary civic museums which were diverting from some of the norms um, of his model. So increasingly, museums have become more interactive, more em with more emphasis on participation, on popular exhibits, um, and uh, with more consultation about, uh, with minority groups about represent their representation. And so this also begged me to, quite bit, to think about to what extent a sex museum is part of this move, move away from um, these kinds of uh, governmental classificatory modes of civic museums. Um, and to what extent is the shadow of more marginal institutions, so fairgrounds, wax museums, cabinets of curiosity, still present in sex museums? And further, to what extent do sex museums disrupt expectations of a masculine, rational, detached mode of engagement presumed by national civic museums? And with what consequences for assumption about gender, sexual normativity, and national identity? So the transnational piece of this project is something that really interests me a lot. <coughs> and so I'm also thinking about what the, these sex museums can tell us about transnational circulations um, of ideas and objects um, to do with sexuality. And how can we read the museums, and, and as well as how their curators and directors talk about them as reflecting the changing deployments of sexuality in different places and different times. And if, as Lisa Rofel suggests, sexual desire is part of the contemporary performance of, in her study, Chinese, but we could argue global cos cosmopolitanism, how do sex museums participate in this performance? And as I was beginning this study, um, I noticed that the European and, U and American museums are packed with Asian artifacts. Um, so this is, we're not talking about a simple question of west to east flows, um, but much more of, an, of, of transnational flows of sexual materials and discourses that have shadowed more legitimate trade routes. And this, this I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to find out, is, is actually a shadow um, trade economy that's, that's been going on for at least 200 years, that's my hunch. So how are the very discourses exported to Asia from Europe and the US themselves shaped by Orientalist ideas about sexuality um, imagined um, in the East? And as Jennifer Tybersi asks, in her comparison of US and Mexican sex museums, how is globalization sexed? So I'm thinking about sex museums as one site where we can actually, or a you know, collection of sites where we can actually think about that question. Um, so, thus far, um, I have visited, I've, I've almost com completed the field uh, research here. Um, so I visited um, four museums in Japan, so in the, in the kind of East Asia component, four in Japan, uh, two in Korea, and two in China. Um, and then one in Italy, a couple in the Netherlands, one in Spain, and two um, temporary um, exhibitions, and I can talk a little bit more about that in the UK in London. Um, in the United States, uh, uh, New York, um, Bloomington, Indiana, uh, Las Vegas, and I'm just about to take a trip to the um, World Erotic Art Museum in <coughs> Miami in December. And so these um, uh, field visits include um, a, a kind of lengthy trip through the galleries um, and a collection of all the materials I can find um, about them beforehand. Um, but also lots of photographs. I have to thank uh, Valentina Carlo for taking photos for this project um, and interviews with the directors and curators. Um, I have to say that the interviews, uh, I've done some interviews in um, the UK and all of the interviews in um, all of the sites in uh, East Asia and um, North America or the United States. And in, for the East Asian part of the project, I've been working with a collaborator each in China, uh, Japan, and Korea, um, who's helping me kind of set up interviews, um, um, interpret the interviews, and work out you know, sort of, uh, what's going on in the galleries. So I'm, I, one of the things I was committed to was actually having a collaboration with people, local people doing that. So, um, what I'm going to do today is broadly outline some of the classificatory practices of the museums, firstly. And then I'm going to move on to talk about the ways that the museums disrupt the norms of civic museums in the ways that people are allowed to or encouraged to engage with the exhibits. 
Um, and then um, at sort of towards the end, I'm going to wrap up by talking about the extent to which mobility of discourses and people um, between museums um, offer the potential for queering their contexts. So when we're thinking about classifying sex, I'm playing a bit fast and loose with the term sex museum. More precisely, I'm interested in institutional spaces that publicly display erotic materials. Um, but this leads to the question, you know, what is erotic? Um, what is a sexual object? Now, many of the places that we visited um, <coughs> have sort of put paid to this question uh, because they call themselves sex or erotic museums, so the Amsterdam Erotic Museum, the Las Vegas Erotic Heritage Museum, and so on. And these kinds of titles suggest that everything inside um, is intended to be read as sexual. But others are not so clear. Um, for example, um, the objects... Um, exhibited in the uh, secret cabinet of the Naples Archaeology Museum. Um, and these relics from Pompeii and Herculaneum weren't necessarily sexual at all uh, when they were originally made and used. But on the right hand here, you can see these flying phalluses. Um, they've got wings and they've got bells, because you know, phalluses, wings, and flying, and, and bells are all considered auspicious. And the people um, hung these in their homes um, as talismans for good luck. So the question is, are these sex objects? Um, and if not, did they become sex objects when they were sequestered in the museum's secret cabinet in the mid-19th century with other more expressly erotic materials, for instance, scenes of sexual penetration and so on? Um, and initially, access to this secret cabinet was, res was restricted to male adults. Um, and even today, contemporary visitors um, have to make an appointment to go in, and it doesn't allow anybody under um, the age of 14. So does this kind of special framing make sexual something that was not originally so, but ha has sex in some ways kind of thrust upon it by later categorization and display? And another example of this um, was in a Shinto shrine in the suburbs of Tokyo, uh, the Kaniyama Shrine, which is famous for their annual uh, penis worship um, uh, fertility festival. And this small museum next to the shrine um, was full of small wooden phalluses, hand-carved uh, by um, everyday people, and offered to the shrine to ask for good fortune uh, with getting pregnant um, and having a healthy baby. So here the objects are less to do with sex per se than with fertility. Um, are these phalluses sex objects? Do they become so uh, when they're put in cabinets alongside other more frankly sexual and commercial artifacts, for instance, in one, in one, in one cabinet, there's a, these are combined with a series of saucy key rings collected from a, a souvenir shop in Athens. And how differently might we need to think about what we understand by sex when this um, religious shrine, the sex museum that went with it, and a kindergarten share the same grounds and parking lot. Um, and it's, it was unimaginable to me that a church, school, and sex museum um, would similarly coexist in a Western context. Or to think about this conversely, how does zoning, uh, for example, Giuliani's notorious zoning out of commercial sex establishments from Times Square in New York in the 1990s actually produce spaces as erotic when they might not otherwise be so? <clears throat> so what I'm arguing here is that um, sex doesn't reside um, in the object. Um, but it's produced through the object's biography, how it moves in and out of various institutional and practical economic spheres to come to reside in this loose connection of institutions. So many of, the, um, many of these museums classify and display materials in ways that reproduce uh, norms of sex. So women's bodies are, are um, displayed to be looked at, um, and this is a very large, uh, you can't quite get a sense of scale, but it's a very large figure that was in um, uh, Loveland in Korea, which is kind of an outdoor theme, sexual theme park. Um, so and this was an interactive exhibit. Uh, this is a model, and she's sitting, it's a little hard to see, but she's sitting behind a, a kind of SM-themed chair, and you can sit in the chair and have your photo taken. Um, and um, here's something that people may, you know, sort of these, these are known as kind of French photos, so they're not, obviously not only taken in France anymore, but used to be very popular in French, they're much uh, more recently classic French photos. So this is a, a, a kind of display that was in um, the Amsterdam Sex Museum in the Netherlands. 
So when we're looking at images of women, we tend to see um, their whole bodies. Um, their whole bodies are available <coughs> to look at them. Um, but male sexuality, increasingly, uh, when, uh, when you saw single items, i.e. Mean, not people in actual sexual um, uh, activities, uh, tended to be represented more by, simply by the phallus. Um, and this phallus was unattached to their body. So this is a sort of um, kind of fun, this was a very popular um, sort of playful museum. And this is a, a ride that you can sit on. Um, this was from the Las Vegas Erotic Heritage Museum. And this is a cock and balls entirely made of pennies. Um, and this was um, from the China Sex Culture Museum in Tongli. Um, and um, was known as women's dependence, which I um, particularly appreciated or not. Um, so, and I'm thinking, so this has got me thinking about, you know, the, the presence of the phallus and, and Richard Dyer's work on the instabilities of the male pinup, which is um, that, that the phallus, with all the power that comes with it, is actually quite difficult to sustain when it's actually attached to a vulnerable body. Now, um, what, what I find a lot in terms of the museums is that the local censorship rules help to shape how much sex, sexual activity is depicted. Um, and when sex acts are shown, they're almost always, um, or mostly, vaginal penile, penile intercourse between women and men. So we get a whole selection uh, through the museum. <coughs> um, China's was actually a very beautiful little box with this carving on the lid. Um, this shows a scene from um, a, a sex museum in Japan, which, and, and the Japanese ones quite often have these kinds of elaborate um, tableaus of models, and this, this tells the story of a, a famous samurai who's just about to go to war, and he's sort of having, um, having a night with his concubines before he leaves. Um, and then even in sort of disembodied objects, uh, the theme of um, penetration continues. So this, this is one where, if you imagine closing the lid, then um, the genitals actually meet. Um, there's some very inventive uh, exhibits. Um, so European museums are somewhat more likely to show oral sex, um, almost always as wi with women as um, agents and men as recipients. Um, and there are occasional, more, uh, occasional images of women having sex together, um, often including a man in the frame. So um, this is sort of one example of uh, women having sex together. But, um, often there were either men in the frame itself, as in uh, this one, or these um, sort of same-sex female um, images were a mask of a, a really obviously heterosexual um, postcards and some pictures and so on, suggesting <coughs> that um, lesbian sex is a kind of foreplay before the main event. Um, and okay, more occasionally there are images of men having sex together, uh, but when these are included in a collection, they tend to be separated from the other materials, so they're sequestered, unlike the women, um, the, the lesbian scenes, um, in something that I would just call like the gay wall. And this was an example from um, the Netherlands, where um, it was actually really difficult to see this exhibit because it was kind of behind the staircase and a lot of the materials were quite small. Um, so despite this kind of sequestering of some kinds of same-sex sexuality, many of the museums um, have an explicit commitment to sexual liberalism and diversity, um, sometimes in awkward relationship um, to the organization of the exhibits. So for example, in the Museum of Sex Culture in Tongli, um, it had a sign about, um, uh, the title of the sign was Manifold Sexual Deviation, and, and the content of this was basically to say that some people deviate from sexual norms both in their method of having sex um, and or their objective desire, excuse me, objective desires. Um, but the message was that if this damages society, it should be prohibited, but if not, it should be tolerated. <coughs> so it's sort of, um, <coughs> kind of uh, fairly, sort of <coughs> somewhat progressive um, approach. But at the same time, in that same museum, um, images of older men and their young student lovers, and, and my Chinese collaborator, collaborator used the term catamite um, for, for this younger person, um, or uh, images of women in an erotic embrace were part of a gallery that featured other kinds of non-normative sexual expression, including a famous story of adultery, a cartoon scroll depicting Japanese men's sexual voraciousness um, and bestiality. So this idea that on the one hand they're saying, you know, you know, that, People are different, as long as it doesn't harm anybody, it's okay. And then when you actually see the exhibits, 
um, that there are troubling relationships between um, same-sex sexuality and other things that are considered non-normative or deviant. Um, a few sites, such as New York's Museum of Sex, offer much more explicit commitment to GLBT visibility and to queer exhibits, especially in their rotating gallery spaces. Um, so I also want to talk a little bit about sex museums as a, as a national project. Um, and I began thinking about this drawing from Bennett and others who've argued that civic museums stage national integrity and difference in an overall project of representing progress. Um, and the use of sexuality and the assertion of nat national or, or regional superiority um, has had a troubling history in museums, though. Um, and most infamously, the autopsy and display of Sarah Bartman's genitals, she was a South African, um, in the Paris uh, Musée d'Ethnographie throughout much of the 19th and 20th century. And these were only removed from exhibition in 1974. <coughs> and there's no shortage of national references in the sex museums. Almost all of them include references to sexual cultures beyond the national borders of their setting. Um, sometimes these are fairly generic, um, as in this uh, poster or the um, yeah this um, sign from the China Sex Museum in Tongli, um, referring to colourful foreign sexual culture. Um, and the sign is, is hard to read when it's projected like this, but basically says um, people that you know countries are different, and we need to respect other people but all countries are marked by increasingly open attitudes towards sexuality and sort of progress narrative. Other spaces were organized more like an ethnographic exhibit. Uh, for instance, Korea's Sex and Health Museum on Jeju Island, which is a, a kind of tourist zone. Um, and this place had specific areas for Egypt, Pompeii, South America, which is mainly represented by Peru, India, and Japan. And, th and these are in, in that order. Um, and the implications of progress both uh, progress from, in terms of historical eras and also um, from more, in quotes, primitive cultures to Korea as the pinnacle of erotic experiment, expression. Um, and others more playfully in that national stereotypes. Um, for example, this fiberglass, these fiberglass models from the Garden of International Love in Korea's Loveland, um, which shows sculptures of trysting couples in culturally recognizable garb. Um, and what's really interesting to me is in almost all of these, um, there, there was about eight or ten of them, um, and the women are almost always almost na nearly naked, and most of the kind of cultural reference comes from um, the men. So, for instance, uh, we have Greek love, uh, which is, is interesting to me that this is represented by Pan, and not what we usually think about as Greek love, which is um, um, same-sex men. Um, uh, African love and American love, so represented by a um, colonial era um, coat. So there are ways then that sex museums draw upon classification strategies familiar from, uh, from, from civic museums in defining what sex museums, uh, sorry, in defining what sex means um, in this context by organizing normative and non-normative practices and by staging a narrative of progress, history and distinction. Um, in presenting a range of objects from other places. But the museums are very different in their degree to which they reproduce the normal <coughs> behavior, usually associated with the traditional <coughs> civic museums. Some use cabinets, frames, and signage to guide visitors towards an appropriately ocular, rational, and detached in enlightenment seeking perspective on it in, in exhibits. And um, this is something, apart from the content, this is something that we would recognize um, from any museum that uh, we would go to. This is from um, the Sex and Culture Museum in, in Tom Lee. But many others encourage a kind of haptic, kinesthetic, sensual, emotional, and immersive mode of engagement through their exhibits appeals to popular pleasure and participation. So what are some of the ways that the, these museums diverge from the assumptions underpinning civic museums? And I'm just going to talk about three here. I think there are more, but um, these seem to be the ones that are the most significant and interesting at the moment. So the first thing is that many of the museums are expressly um, and highly participatory. So this is um, a, a, a kind of setup in one of the uh, Chinese museums we went to. Um, and basically, again, it's a little dark, but on the table in front of this figure, there's a microphone. And this figure is a life-size um, replica, a sort of Im image of um, uh, Louis Darlin, who is the uh, founder and um, director of this museum. 
Um, and what you can do is you can sit in front of him and ask him one of a series of 33 questions, and that's what's written behind him on the back, such as, is homosexuality a disease? And he gives you the written <coughs> answer. Um, so things like this uh, you know, strike me as incredibly participatory, the idea is that you engage with it. I mean, there's lots to say about his legacy and his, his putting himself in this um, situation, but um, I'll save that for maybe the Q&A. Um, there's also, um, th so this I see as a kind of voluntary participation, but also the museums um, specialize in surprising uh, people, so using um, you know, some kinds of triggers to actually set up exhibits. So we have this as a, a, a the flasher um, exhibit, which is actually quite a trope. We also see what, the same kind of thing in um, China. Um, and Another kind of participation involves photography, which um, is not only allowed but encouraged in these museums. So um, people are allowed to touch and have photos taken uh, with exhibits. And we saw lots of people um, giving blowjobs to uh, phalluses in some shape or form, such as this woman who was having her photo taken here. Um, but also, the, the um, museums offer um, the the, in, an invitation to actually participate in the scene itself. So this was um, one of those carnival cutout things um, in uh, Loveland in uh, Korea. Um, Superman getting a, a hand job from Superman from Wonder Woman, isn't it? Um, uh, and but also in the European ones. And this is me having a go. Um, at this but it just looks unbelievably creepy to me. But anyway, uh, there it is. That's what they look like. So this idea that not only do they allow people to take uh, photos, but part of the participatory um, elements of the museums that they they set up these kinds of spaces where they encourage you to, to participate and, and take your photo. Um, and there's also the issue of touch. Um, so many of the museums <coughs> allow or encourage um, touch, and so this happens in loads of different ways. Um, many of the museums had some kind of uh, place or way of touching exhibits. So. Um, this is a stone phallus that's in, on the entryway to um, uh, one of the Japanese museums. And you can see that the top is kind of darkened by many people passing this and just running their hands over the... Um, um, running their hands over the top of the, um, the penis as they're going into the... Um, uh, into the museum, um, and this is another Japanese example. So this was taken from um, a corridor in which there were all these kind of body parts. I think they were all female, um, and the the paint is is pretty much rubbed off um, the nipple here. So there's loads of examples where people have sort of routinely or habitually um, touched um, elements um, of these museums. But some museums um, struggle with the with the kind of implication of the in, in, you know, it's the impulse to touch. Um, and they do this um, in part, I think, to signal uh, that they're oriented towards much more of the kind of mode of engagement that the civic national museums um, display. And so um, this was a postcard from the Museum of Sex uh, saying, please do not touch lips or mount the exhibits. And this really interested me. Um, and when I talked about it with the director and curator from the Museum of Sex, um, they suggested that they, they needed to put this um, out, you know, because there's a, there's a poster um, as in, in the museum as well saying this, and that they needed to kind of make this clear because people were so overcome by the sort of jouissance, they didn't use that word, but that's sort of what I imagine they were talking about, that, you know, that they couldn't help themselves uh, but actually um, touch or mount the exhibits. Um, and I actually thought that the postcard was a really savvy kind of marketing that promised visitors that they'd want to touch the exhibits even if they admonished this behavior at the same kind of time. And I was thinking that it's useful um, in all of these kinds of forms of participation, but particularly touch, to think about um, museum going in general, but particularly museum, sex museum going, as a form of ritual behavior um, on the part of visitors. And um, museum uh, scholar uh, Carol Duncan suggests that, um, that su suggests that though she sees museums as staging specifically um, civilizing rituals, um, she, sorry, I've, I've, 
messed up that sentence. So Carol Duncan argues that she sees museums as, uh, as places of ritual, but she sees them as um, civilizing rituals. So basically, we go to museums in order to kind of get enculturated, um, particularly around class norms of behavior. Um, and that rather than she's seeing ritual as a form of um, transcendence, uh, that people actually go to museums to appreciate something transcendent, um, and she argues that even in the kind of transcendence that we might get from going to a museum, like an art museum, um, she argues that this, is, this kind of experience is put to work towards much more prosaic structural forms of discipline. But what was interesting was that I was really struck uh, when we were in um, Italy um, on, en route to the Naples Museum, uh, we went to Rome um, and to St. Peter's uh, Basilica, and um, there's a bronze statue of St. Peter there that's cordoned off. Um, but it was, it was notable, noticeable, even from outside the cordon, that his left foot um, was visibly eroded. Um, and a uh, recent PhD, Linda Nolan, um, in her dissertation, she affirms that visitors uh, from pilgrims to casual tourists ritually, and we can think about this as both religiously <coughs> and habitually touched the foot, so you can see here, this, this was from her dissertation, and she took this, obviously, before they called it off. And the person isn't especially paying attention to doing this. This isn't necessarily a kind of what we think of as kind of moment of uh, religious worship, but more uh, something, you know, that, that becomes a kind of habit. Catherine, is that person being photographed? Like yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. well, possibly. Actually, I don't know. What, by somebody else outside the frame? Yeah. Yeah, possibly. That, that's true. Um, but what's interesting to me is that they're not, you know, it's not, this isn't a, um, the gesture of sort of, you know, somebody who's, who's having a, a kind of profound moment. But, so, um, so she, so Nolan t links touch uh, with an embodied experience. Um, and I'm thinking of whether we can see the urge to touch uh, phallic vulval and other sexualized body parts in, in the sex museums similarly as a form of ritual um, and as a desire for embodied, not just ocular experience. At the same time, though, uh, we need to remember that touch is a form of privilege not necessarily share, equally shared by everybody who encounters the sex museum. So I'm thinking about the you know, question of who gets to touch you know, curators, restorers, visitors, do we all get to touch? Um, how we get to touch, you know, we, we can touch things as precious objects, we can touch things professionally, we can touch things playfully. Um, but also, who gets to touch other people? Um, and I'm, I'm really struck by the amount of touch that goes on amongst visitors in museums. So we see groups of men kind of roughhousing um, in the gallery spaces, or heterosexual couples um, smuggling each other. Um, and further, the museums use participation and especially touch, the permission to touch or, or the prohibition on touch to signal the status in, its status in a class hierarchy of museums with a more participatory lowbrow museums at one end, um, i.e. the touching end, and the distanced highbrow museums at the other. <clears throat> so the second um, ways in which the sex museums kind of work against the usual conventions of civic museums is that they don't really care about origins. Um, as I mentioned from the uh, statue at the beginning, um, some do, um, and they have very old and valuable objects, for example, in Naples. Um, but others, uh, frank, frank, others frankly display copies, for example, uh, you know, the example of plates from Pompeii. <coughs> So this suggests that the meaning and value of the objects isn't there in their uniqueness, but in the necessity of having an era or a place represented when objects aren't available or budgets won't stretch to investments in highly valuable objects. Yet as Stephen Conn argues, the emphasis on originality and value um, is another modern invention. And he writes, the curiosities and exotica that were the staple of antebellum dime store museums and Barnabas display um, had, had been dismissed in these 19th century museums in favor of objects that had a legitimate pedigree, gone to, banished to the basement with the casts and reproductions that had once filled art galleries. So the emphasis on originals um, is, is, again, another kind of modern um, invention. And so copies, um, as well as other um, cheap uh, trinkets, mass-produced items, and ephemera, 
um, and as well as found objects. And here we, on the uh, left, we've got this um, a piece of coral and a shell that's obviously just been kind of picked up, um, possibly from a seaside uh, town. Um, and the, you know, the idea is that these look like bulbers. Um, and, uh, and these are both in the same museum. Um, and so on the right hand side, we've got these uh, uh, statues and figures that come from on top of the shelf, at least that have um, been bought um, fairly cheaply, I would guess, um, in Thailand. So um, in my discussion with Liu Darlin, the collector and curator of the two Chinese museums we visited re recently, um, he, and I was talking about um, copies, because he has a lot of copies in his museum. And he distinguished his sex culture museum from a sex history museum. And he said that the history museum would put a premium on the historical authenticity of the objects. On the other hand, a sex culture museum could show copies of an object to demonstrate elements of the history and diversity of sexual materials and knowledge. So the importance of this um, took on a uh, poignant aspect when he discussed having been called to a police station during the height of the Cultural Revolution uh, by a friendly official who invited him to photograph sexual materials that were seen as decadent uh, by the party and were about to be destroyed. And so Liu went on um, to use these photographs to approach um, skilled craftsmen um, in, uh, 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 and uh, get these people to make copies um, of the stuff that was destroyed. And the, these copies were then put in the museum. Um, so with some exceptions then, the presence of copies uh, was often a sign of more entertainment-oriented museums, a kind of lower-brow form, uh, whereas the museums that claimed high-brow status, for instance, the Museum of Sex or the Naval Museum, um, could do so in part by emphasizing the value and authenticity of their objects. And um, the third uh, way that sex museums um, diverge from civic norms is um, in their, frankly, commercial <coughs> appeals. <coughs> So with the tradition of civic museums, the question of economic capital was effaced as an un unseemly concern in the broader task of cultural elevation. This commercial effacement um, has more recently been ruptured by blockbuster exhibitions and savvy merchandising that requires us to exit through the gift shop. Um, sex museums are openly commercial, most of them. Um, and this, place take, this takes place in a number of ways that violates the separation of culture from capital maintained um, usually even in the most aggressively revenue-generating efforts of contemporary civic museums. And so I'm just going to touch on a few ways um, that this manifests. So one, one is that sex museums are often quite expensive compared with local alternatives. Um, second is that sex museums sometimes double as art galleries. Um, there's lots to say about these, these paintings, but I'm just going to use them as the moment um, because they're all, they're all for sale. And this was from uh, Barcelona. Um, and others have merchandise for sale throughout the gallery. So again, this is from Bar Barcelona. So this was just a cabinet in amongst the other kinds of exhibits. And, and you can buy a t-shirt or a necklace or, and so on. Um, many of the museums, including the, the Kinsey Institute, have branded merchandise for sale, cups, hats, posters, water bottles, and so on. And I actually took this from the website, but um, I, was, I, was sort of, I thought this was a bit of savvy marketing on the part of Kinsey, the Kinsey Institute knowing the kind of ongoing um, uh, use of the Kinsey scale. And so these are Kinsey scale uh, t-shirts so you can order. Yeah. Um, but also, most uh, obviously, um, they're commercial in the stores that, that are attached to the museum. So all of the museums that we, had, that we went to had stores um, of some kind. And these sold everything from replicas of museum items um, to sex toys, books, gag gifts, bachelor um, and bachelorette party items, pornographic museums, and, and videos. So this is uh, from Amsterdam. So this is sort of uh, fun kind of gag gifts that people would, would give away. Um, this was uh, from a museum in, in Japan, where there are actually quite beautiful little uh, models of these different kinds of um, SN-type scenes. Um, and uh, the Loveland uh, theme park had a very large store in the, in, the, um, in the middle of it with some very beautiful displays of different things that you could buy. So this is sort of um, fairly soft um, SM kind of related paraphernalia. Um, and this was a view of the store more generally to kind of get a sense of the size and um, how popular it was and how much stuff they had. Um, and so the degree of separation of merchandise from exhibits and the type and quality of the merchandise 
and its retail context signaled a museum's claim um, to status. So frank um, and inexpensive materials and commercial appeals were consistent with more entertainment-oriented or, or and participatory uh, museums. Some museums then draw from the civic museum norms of, its, of engagement, prohibiting touch, for example, or playing down their commercial raison d'etre. However, others encourage, even profit from visitors' transgress transgressions of usual museum appropriate behavior. But Bennett encourages, uh, encourages us to be skeptical that body participatory experiences are necessarily transgressive. In his chapter on the Pleasure Beach Amusement, Beach Amusement Park at Blackpool in the UK, and so what Bennett argues here is that um, that he disputes that this is a site of Bactinian carnival, um, <coughs> because the the commercial premise of the entire enterprise, um, which kind of contains the physical experience within a familiar capitalist economy, so he's saying just because you know it's bodily engaging doesn't necessarily mean that this is transgressive. And so I'm arguing that the transgressions of civic museum norms of the sex museums don't necessarily disrupt their commercial premise, nor do they encourage visitors to be reflexive about the gender and sexual norms or national affiliations that constitute the museum's underlying logics. However much we might enjoy permission to behave in a very unmuseum-like way, um, there's nothing necessarily political in these kinds of transgressions. However, Bennett also notes that, these, that sites that promise transgression, like the amusement park, can only partly contain their ideological coding. And I believe we can still look for places of rupture that have potential for different modes of engagement. So the thing that saves us from a kind of deadening hegemony and in institutional discipline is, I believe, to look at the museums as sites <coughs> of mobility, not only static and essentializing as they often are, but as sites where movement of different kinds opens up queer possibility. And I just want to talk about two examples of this. They're quite different, uh, but it's something that I, sort of, I think might, might be quite an exciting um, kind of route of analysis. Um, and so one of them is to do with um, the role of sexology and, and global circuits of academic and quasi-academic knowledge. And so this is part of a very large sign, quite near the beginning of Korea's Sex and Health Museum, which included a huge illuminated panel, uh, much of which was in uh, Korean, but was also um, some in English. And it was a, the Declaration of International Sexual Rights. And so, for instance, um, Article 1 talks about the right to sexual freedom. Uh, sexual freedom encompasses the possibility for individuals to express their full sexual potential. However, this excludes all forms of sexual coercion, exploitation, and abuse at any time and situation in life. Um, and so this panel had been taken from uh, the language of, um, of this uh, declaration, which had, had been adopted at the World Congress of Sexology in Hong Kong in 1999. And I was really curious about the language just that seemed to me to be borrowed fairly directly from the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and to think about how this borrowing lubricates the flow of discourses across national borders. At the same time, the movement of sexual liberation discourse opened up their queer potential. So unfortunately, I don't have a photo of this, but on a wall, along from the de this Declaration of Sexual Rights was a panel that was very sympathetic to the plight of people who are, in quotes, not heterosexual. And I'm surprised even by this somewhat oblique reference to homosexuality, because I'd heard that talk about same-sex sex and relationships was pretty much taboo in Korea. And when I mentioned this, um, this panel um, positively to the museum's founder, he deflected the question, saying that the exhibit had been designed by his staff, who were experts, not him. He was just a businessman. So uh, on the one hand, I said, oh, it's, that's so great to see that. And he said, I don't know anything about it. They put it together. It wasn't me. Um, and so this example suggests that at the Sex and Health Museum, at least, a putatively universal language of human rights about sexuality is used to signal a commitment to cosmopolitan modernity. But at the same time, this commitment's ambivalent, especially when its elements are troubling to other Korean values, such as family, harmony, or collectivism. Nevertheless, for visitors to the museums who may not have seen a public acknowledgement of same-sex relationships, this moment opens up a space around the sexual, usual constraints placed upon sexuality by other social and familial obligations. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and the sec second thing I want to talk about, type of mobility, is the mobility of people. And obviously there's lots of people involved in sex museums, but I'm just going to talk about tourists here. Um, and one of the things that we've asked uh, museum uh, directors is about you know, who comes and has this changed over time, who, who comes to visit. Um, and there's, a, there's been a very significant um, change in the gender dimensions of tourism, both in um, the, the uh, European and uh, American, and in the East Asian sites. Um, and so, for example, the early Japanese museums was, were designed almost exclusively for groups of male tourists or businessmen who would visit during commercial trips. However, both in Japan and elsewhere in Asia, large numbers of women are visiting the museums. Um, often in groups, and so this is a picture from um, Loveland, this, this group of women that's looking out over this scene. Um, as a result, the question of interpolation um, had at times a very queer dimension, and so one of the, the um, very sort of early um, sex museums, the Tarmi, that was designed in the 1960s, uh, basically they had this chair, and they had lots of sort of um, kind of slightly cheesy kind of special effects kind of displays. Anyway, so you sat in the, in the chair, or I sat in the chair, and I could see myself in the chair, <coughs> like a mirror, but also there's a video play, so you're sort of in the scene, it was clearly sort of half uh, just projected. And in this video, this very attractive young uh, Japanese uh, woman who's dressed up as a, as a waitress uh, approaches the person sitting in the chair, me, um, you know, serves some kind of beverage, then undresses, and because of um, Japanese censorship laws, you can't actually see her vulva. But when she's stripped naked, her vulva is covered by this giant um, opening, glowing clam. <laughs> and um, so, so it was it was sort of quite an experience to sit there. Um, and because I was as I was sitting there, I was thinking, this this scene is not designed for me. But at the same time, I'm sitting here. Um, and it seemed to open up a lot of sort of queer potential that there I was experiencing this kind of same-sex moment, watched by other people in the gallery. Um, and so as, as women become more mobile as tourists, um, and thus come into contact with materials not necessarily intended for their personal desire, this potentially queers the space of the museum in interesting ways. And it's these moments of queerness that, diff uh, that different types of mobility afford. Um, that signal the ongoing significance of the, fit, of the physical presence and experience of sex museums. Um, because one ongoing question I have is why would these museums exist, um, even uh, recently have been, become more plentiful in a digital age where we can see anything we want online? And obviously that is very actually quite country specific. So for example in Korea, uh, we can't see anything we want online because they have quite strict online censorship rules about um, pornography sites. So most of the museums have only rudimentary websites, if any web presence at all. Um, and so it really emphasizes the importance of their physical space. And so I'm beginning to think about this question, and I think it has a lot to do with the physical experience of being in the space, um, and especially their participatory aspects. And people come to the space in order to participate in particular kinds of ways. Um, that it, it reflects these changing patterns of tourism, and particularly the cultural capital involved in being able to travel and being able to go to these spaces. Um, and also I think it's got something to do with the social and relational experience that might be more um, uh, pleasurable or somehow present to actually be there uh, with other people um, in an embodied space rather than online. And it's partly the physical experience of being in the space, of being co-present with others, that opens up the sex museum's queer potential. Um, so even, in the, even within the dominant hege hegemony of heterosexual national cultures, um, these can offer examples of sexual mobility that open up spaces or, um, or what I'm working, this idea that I'm working with, um, of contact zones. And this, this is going to be my kind of concluding um, point, which is um, I'm looking at um, Arif Derlek's critique of theories of Orientalism, and where he describes cultural exchange between China and Europe um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries um, in much more reciprocal terms than the traditional or Oriental, um, Orientalist critique um, afford. And he writes, the contact zone is not merely a zone of domination, but also a zone of exchange, even if unequal exchange, which Mary Louise Pratt describes as transculturation. 
Um, so we can see sex museums as offering a range of contact zones, not only among global recent regions, but also practices, identities, and forms of social belonging, not equal uh, to each other, or even intended by the museum's design, designers, but contact zones that are experienced nonetheless through patterns of mobility. And this mobility involves the interdependence of different types of movement about, among objects, discourses, and people. And here I just talked about one example of discourses and people. But we can think about um, collectors and curators and tourists and how these people move, how people move, how people and things move between different nations and regions, and how this kind of movement gets facilitated by all sorts of uh, transnational flows. We can think about international trade, transnational media industries, government policies, even wars, NGOs, um, and a range of other manifestations of economic, technological, and cultural contact. Thank you. Thank you.